A few years ago, uh, cracks in the foundation of a three-story apartment building near Calcutta, India, led to the collapse of the building and the blockage of a local canal. Uh, there was video, actually, of it caught on a nearby camera as it collapsed down into the canal. Now, thankfully, uh, the building collapsed the day after a large rainstorm, so both there had been issues with the building noticed during the storm, so no one was in it when it collapsed. But also, uh, it, locals had said that if the building had collapsed during a monsoon, that one failed foundation could have cost many families their homes in the flooding that would have proceeded from that blocked canal. Uh, locals claimed that the person who had built the building with a shabby foundation and closer to the canal than was strictly allowed had disappeared uh, following the collapse of the building and was not expected to be seen in the area again soon. In recent years, and especially in coming to a head in the last five years or so, our society has been absolutely reeling over the answer to two simple questions. What does it mean to be a woman? And what does it mean to be a man? And these questions are not only causing divisions between different uh, religious and social groups, but within groups that were formerly considered tight-knit communities. Back in 2021, the American Humanist Association, one of the most well-known atheist organizations in the U.S., rescinded their 1996 Man of the Year Award that they had given to Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous atheists in the world, because Dawkins had been vocally questioning the tenets behind the transgender movement. And this division reaches down to the smallest units of our world as well, dividing families one from another as our answers to these questions can drive us apart from each other. As a church, we're going to be tackling this and a handful of other pressing cultural issues on these questions of gender and sexuality during the course of this series. But before we can approach the subjects head on, we need to make sure our foundation is secure. We don't want to be like the building in the video, uh, seeking to grow more and more bold in facing outward issues and struggles while we have an inadequate foundation for the task that we are trying to accomplish. So last week, Krishan set our foundation for the whole series, and especially on questions of sexuality, by talking about the relationships between the Trin members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the way that we as human beings are meant to reflect those relationships back out into the world around us. He also gave us some foundational presuppositions or truths that we're sitting on as a congregation during this uh, series. The Bible being God's word, our need to base our lives off of the whole of God's word and not just a proof text here or there. Our willingness to admit that we often and regularly fail and that we're always seeking uh, to reform our minds and our hearts more and more to the word of God. So those, those are going to guide our discussions, and today I'm going to try to set the foundation for questions of gender. We're going to look at general principles and some specific examples of how the Bible views men and women. What does it mean to be a man or a woman? How are we different? How are we the same? And what is our goal as image bearers of the image of God, male and female. So let's look this morning at the general, very basic version of what the Bible tells us about men and women. We're going to start in 1 Timothy 5 and then go to Matthew 19 as we look at some differences that we see in the Bible. 1 Timothy 5 says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. And then transitioning into Matthew 19, it says the Pharisees came up to him, Jesus, and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Jesus answered them, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. In these and many other passages throughout the Bible, we see that there is a difference between men and women. In Genesis, God creates humanity intentionally as two genders. 
God is all-powerful. He could have created us as one gender that does procreation solo or as non-gendered beings who can fulfill either role in procreation according to need or desire. We know he could have done those things because there are other species of life on our planet who do just that. It's not like it slipped God's mind and a few days later he went, oh, it would have been so much more simple if I had just made them as one gender. Why didn't I do that? No, the creation of humanity as male and female, two distinct genders, is intentional and not accidental. It happens before the fall. It is not a part of the brokenness of humanity that we see around us. Right from the start, we see that clearly, at some level, there is a distinction and difference between the two genders. This has always been obvious on the biological side of things. We are just anatomically different from one another. This continues to be obvious even with changes in our culture as we've seen a massive rise in recent years in gender reassignment surgery. When we believe that gender comes from our, our minds, our, our, our thoughts, our emotions more than our bodies, we seek to conform those bodies because that difference is so obvious. The biological realities of gender are inescapable. We also see throughout scripture a tendency towards general, not universal, not binding, not always and definite, but general and common differences in the way that men and women think or feel in different situations. This is one of those really important, please give me the benefit of the doubt in not hearing what I'm not saying. The New Testament often gives moral dis directions to men and women separately, and it points out that there are some sins that are more prevalent in men than women, and vice versa, and some ways that we can promote being God's ambassadors by our character, which one gender or the other tends towards more naturally. Again, it is critical that we not go further than the scripture does here. These are general principles, not universal. That's going to be really important later in the message. We, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> I might be tipping my hand a little bit here, but I need to acknowledge that a lack of humility and understanding about the difference between usually and always, I think has been a way that we as Christians have sometimes contributed to and exacerbated the crisis that our culture finds itself in today. We got to hold that distinction very strongly between usually and always. Okay, so we see that there are ways that men and women are always different biologically and often experience differences in our mental and emotional processes. Again, often, not always. In our passage from 1 Timothy, Paul treats those differences seriously when he urges Timothy excuse me, to treat the men and women of the Christian community that he is leading differently based on their gender. He says, do not, uh, he says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as, as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. I think, <clears throat> in, in fact, I think in linking gender and anatomical differences here in the verse... Paul gives us our answer as to whether that pairing, gender and biological sex, which our society often divides off into a lot of different categories, whether those two should remain united. And it seems that Paul's answer here is yes. I need to provide a language proviso this morning for the rest of the series, which is that in this series, we're going to be following the lead that I think we find in Genesis and in teaching about gender and biological sex in the New Testament, and we're going to re refer to gender and biological sex as interchangeable terms. Totally understand. That is not how most of our society does it these days. That's okay. That's a cultural apologetics issue of us as Christians learning how to discuss with people we disagree with. But here during the series, we're going to refer to those two as being interlinked. We'll talk a lot more about why we do that and about what our culture as a whole does differently. 
uh, in about three weeks here, we've got a message that is specifically on the question of transgenderism, what's going on in our society, what's going on in our culture, how do we as Christians love people well with what is going on around us. But for today, I just wanted to offer that proviso and make sure we're all on the same page about the language uses that we are choosing here. So having looked at how the Bible acknowledges the difference between genders, we desperately need to also see how the Bible constantly challenges what would have been the prevailing assumptions of the cultures in which it was written to say that those differences between genders do not lead to a difference in value between men and women. How instead, the Bible says, while the Bible acknowledges differences, it constantly calls us back to see the commonalities, the mutuality, and the interdependence between the two genders. So let's look at Galatians 3, which is probably the most explicit passage in Scripture on this topic, but far from the only one that speaks into the vein of mutuality and equal value between men and women. In Galatians 3, starting in verse 23, we read, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So here we find Paul saying that in the new covenant reality of Jesus' redemption, we find reinforcement of the need for salvation that belongs to all human beings. But we also find that the possession of the promises that are given to every human being are regardless of gender. Paul says that in Jesus, we are all, male and female, he's including the whole Christian community there, sons of God. That phrase is really important because this isn't Paul saying, well, Us men are better, but you women can be like us in Jesus. No, no, not not at all. That's not what Paul's getting across here. What he is saying is, hey, in your society, in your culture, you who are reading this message when he wrote it, women are treated as lesser than men. Specifically here he's getting to women can't inherit property. Only sons could inherit property. And so he's saying, you, all of you, male and female, are sons of God in the sense that you are all his children and have been adopted into the full privileges of being his children. You are on the same plane and equal inheritors of salvation in Jesus. This is the the beauty of the gospel that we see in adoption. That the Bible teaches us that we are adopted as the children of God and there are no second class kids. God, God does not have his favorites and his least favorites or something like that. God loves us all equally. He treats us all equally and he seeks our good equally. His death is necessary for us in the exact same way all of us. And the blessings that we receive through his death and his resurrection are exactly the same for all of us. That's how this passage can say, in Christ there is neither male nor female, from the same writer who gives us some of the passages that describe the general differences between genders. He's not saying this doesn't matter for who you are as a person anymore. He's not saying it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Clearly, even still today, that changes the way we experience the world around us, at the very least. It shapes who we are in the way that the world looks at us. He's not saying that doesn't matter anymore. He's saying, in God's eyes, there is no difference now in how much he loves you, how much he cares about you, and and what he has called you to do. Excuse me. But I want to read Titus 2 as well and say that Scripture goes a little bit further than just saying, well, you all need salvation in the same way and you can all receive salvation in the same way. Let's read that passage from Titus 2 that came before a sermon again. 
Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. So I need some congregational participation here. I know we're Presbyterians and shouting things out in the service is extremely uncomfortable to us, but I'm giving us permission to do it right now. All right, we're, we're all taking a deep breath. We're emotionally preparing ourselves to participate in what's going on. Okay, we're, we're there, good. So if women are to teach what is good and be kind, should the men teach lives, excuse me, teach lies and strive for maximum meanness? If the men are to be dignified and self-controlled, should the women be out of control and yelling inappropriate things whenever possible? No. Of course not. We often see moral directives, especially in the New Testament, directed at one gender or the other. But when they are general moral directives that are not influenced by a specific life situation, like being married or, or a specific relational context, when the, when the directives are not put in a specific context, those directives always apply to and are good advice for both genders. Even the passage that has plagued so many a preacher in Ephesians, wives, submit to your husbands, husbands, love your wives, is in the specific context, uh, context of a marriage. It's not a command for all women to submit to all men. It's in the specific context of marriage, and it is in the specific context of the book of Ephesians, having just finished teaching that all Christians are to submit to one another. There's a heavy context going on there. I have to admit this morning, you might begin a little skeptical, this can sound like we're both sides -ing it, that, that we're essentially not trying to take a position. And it's because the options in our culture don't fit with what I'm saying right now. The options in our culture, tend, when, when it comes to what is gender, what does it mean to be a man and woman, they tend to float between two different poles, two different sides. The one side says the genders are entirely different from each other. We need to have little to do with each other. And sometimes even there's a difference in value or, or, or in ability or this, that, or the other between the two. You, you have a different value because of your place on one side of that divide or another. The other side tends to float towards there is no difference. Don't worry about it. There, there, there is no difference. Let's, let's, let's push it all away and, and forget about it and don't worry about it at all. And obviously, this option doesn't fit in with either of those. But both of those options are deeply influenced by our cultural, not biblical, but our cultural gender stereotypes. And I think we see on both sides, uh, we, we see these, these broken ways of looking at gender. That, that, it, that it matters so deeply that it changes our value or that it, it doesn't matter at all. I think we see both of these on both sides of our most prevalent cultural divides. For instance, there are people on both sides of the divide who would argue for the ascendancy of the differences between the two genders. On one side of that cultural divide, you see a transgender movement that says if you don't fit the cultural stereotypes, if you don't fit into the culture's definition of what it means to be gender Y, you are gender X then, because you don't fit into that definition. I know this is simplifying a little bit. I don't, I don't want you to hear that there's nobody who that's not the cause. But I do want you to hear, in my experience, 90 plus percent of the folks that I, I have counseled or talked to who are struggling with gender identity, this is the root. I don't fit in. I'm not really a man. I'm not really a woman because I don't fit into what the culture tells me I'm supposed to be on that side. So yes, there, there are outliers where we're getting into some more complicated questions. In general, I tend to see this happening a lot. The, uh, uh, an idea that the differences between the genders are so important that if I don't fit into them, I should pursue surgical alteration and medical treatment and so on and so forth to go and fit the culture's other definition. 
But on the other side, I see an increasingly loud and angry group that says those gender differences are deeply entrenched, and if you don't fit in, you're less of a real person because you don't fit, I, I see a kind of hyper-masculinity, hyper-femininity that both define themselves, again, not on any biblical standard, but on cultural ideas of what it means to be those things. And in both of these cases, the people involved would say, cultural gender norms trump everything else about you as a person. You, you have to define yourself based on where you fit into those norms. And if you don't fit in, change. One side says use surgical alteration and the other says use your lifestyle choices. Change to fit this definition better in some way, shape, or form. And you can do the same exercise for activists on either side of our cultural divides who want to say there is no distinction, there is no difference. But we as Christians look at those stereotypes and we say so many, we should say, again, being humble, there have been times where we as Christians have, have fallen too far into cultural stereotypes rather than following biblical guidelines and we've, I think, helped push the problem forward. But we should look at it and say these stereotypes are so often based on fallen reality rather than biblical certainty. They're so often built on earthly norms instead of Trinitarian truths. See, I don't think this is a both sides thing. I don't think this is us as a church looking at our cultural divide and saying we need compromise. Because this group over here wants there to be a giant, thick, huge wall between the genders. And this side over here wants there to be nothing in the middle. And we're saying, you know... There is a difference there, but it shouldn't divide us. That in Jesus, it doesn't have to divide us. That's not a half of this half answer and half of this answer. That's not a shorter wall than this side wants and a bigger one than this side wants. It's actually saying, yes, there is, but there's ways through. There are differences, but we don't have to be divided by them because in Jesus, we are all the children of God. As Christians, it's a third way. We don't need a compromise between two bad answers. We need a good answer. And so we as Christians, we say we see the situation differently because we have a different goal and a different purpose. When we as Christians approach the gender question, these gender debates in our society around us, we should not approach them with the goal of smashing gender stereotypes or conforming to them. And that's not our goal in either direction. Our goal is to live as the person that God made us to be for his glory. So let's turn our attention to how God's word focuses on us as men and women together pursuing his glory. We're going to look uh, to do this. We need to read a very brief passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We look at verses 11 and 12. Paul says, nevertheless, nevertheless. In the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Okay, I need to level with y'all this morning. There's a reason we only read two verses in this passage. I like doing passages that have a significantly more context than that. I really like it in at least six, seven, eight verses so you can kind of hear the context. There's a reason we only heard two. And that is that this text comes in one of the hardest to parse cultural boondoggles in the Bible. This, this chapter, this first half of 1 Corinthians 11, is extremely hard to pull apart. Paul gives a boatload of instructions to husbands and wives, men and women, in Corinth. Uh, and he seems to be basing parts of it on shared cultural assumptions and background knowledge that we don't know for sure which one he's trying to bring in and where and what he's talking about in a couple different places. It seems there was something going on in their context about what people were wearing to worship and who was watching them come to worship and what assumptions were being made based off of that, etc., etc., um, it is incredibly difficult to sort out. And in my opinion, anyone who tells you they 100% know what is happening and you should base your spiritual life on their interpretation of this specific passage should be listened to with an iceberg-sized grain of salt. 
But nonetheless, I actually really love this passage. Because right in the middle of all of Paul's really hard to understand and parse, ancient culture dependent, oddly specific in some places, instructions on how men and women, wives and husbands, should relate to each other and so on and so forth, he, he, you know what he does? He, he stops. You almost can feel him take a deep breath when you get to this part of the passage. He's been given all these, these, these instructions, very specific, based on we don't know exactly what. And then you, you feel him kind of go, oh, and say, you know what? Nevertheless, he says, nevertheless, all of this aside, let's, let's pull back from the different cultural things floating around that clearly are important. He's, he's talking about something important going on in the light of the church, but then he pulls back when he says, let's, let's look at the big picture here. Let, let's pull back and look at who we've been made to be as human beings and why. And when he pulls back to that level, he says, you need each other. We need each other. We are not, inter we are not independent of each other. We are, in fact, interdependent. We can't make it apart. We are not whole without each other. Our strengths and weaknesses, our gifts and struggles, our hurts and triumphs, we need each other. The same way Paul talks about the church as a whole, he talks about the genders as a whole. We need each other. And that interdependence is not an accident. Again, just like Adam and Eve being created male and female is not an accident, so too our need for each other today, our interdependence as genders, is not an accident because it points us to the core reality, to the all-important truth that we are dependent beings and ultimately we are dependent on God. Paul says, the, the, says, uh, as a woman was made from man, a man is now born of women. Woman, we are not independent of one another. And he says, and all things are from God. This is supposed to direct us back to how we are dependent in all things on God. And this is where we need to do a bit of a caution this morning. Because you are not enough. I am not enough. And even together, we're not enough says, man is not independent of woman, woman is not independent of man, but then he doesn't say, and when you bring them together, everything's A-OK. -okay. He says, no, even together, all things are from God. You are still dependent on him. Friends, family, Krishan's going to preach on marriage next week, and marriage is a powerful image of our relationship with Jesus. It is a massively important life for most people at some point during their earthly lives, but... If you look for your completion in life in marriage or in any other sexual and romantic relationship outside of a mutual relationship with God, you will not find what you are looking for. You will start to ask too much of each other or you will realize that you cannot find in them all the things that you're looking for and you will have to look for it elsewhere. And it's the same for the relationship between our two genders as a whole. Yes, we can re realize that we are interdependent and that we need each other and this, that, and the other. Without God as the core, without our drive towards his glory in our lives, it will not be enough. We will constantly, at any point, and you can look back in history, throughout human history, and see this over and over, we will always be pulled towards one of those two poles, one of those two sides that we talked about earlier. Either gender, our, our gender differences don't matter at all, and, and we can completely ignore them, in which case we lose the beautiful way that we see God's image across our differences, where, where, where that is an element of how God made you and made me and made us to cooperate with each other in, in a specific way. Or we'll go towards the pole of our differences matter so much that there's a massive un, uh, unbreachable divide and often, as we look throughout history, actually one side or the other is less valuable because of that divide. It's going to push us towards one of those different ways. But in Jesus, we see the promise that he breaks down every line of hostility. You are not enough by yourself man or woman, and never will be to face the brokenness that is inside of you and that is out in the world around you. 
but we have a Savior who loves us in our brokenness and makes a way in dying in our place for us to find wholeness and resurrection in him. We only find the solution for the sometimes legitimate problems that the world points out in that gender barrier between people. We only find the solutions not by pretending there are no differences between us and not by separating ourselves from each other or challenging or deciding our value based on those differences, but rather by believing that God, yes, made us biologically different, but he also made us the same in our need for him and in the call on our lives to glorify him by accepting the gift of salvation from sin and brokenness that we find in Jesus. And, and, we see as Christians, we have been called to use whatever gifts, talents, and abilities he has given us, whether they conform to cultural gender stereotypes or not, to glorify him, to lift his name high in our communities, our churches, and in all of our lives, to live every day as men and women created in his image by him and for him.